<laughs> if you could, uh, put out your uh, tent cards, but fear not if you didn't bring the tent cards, that's okay. I always carry these, but uh, really important if you could to bring these, because at some point my secretary will get frustrated and say, am I eating them? But in the meantime, if you can regularly bring them, that'd be terrific. Let's talk about what we covered the first two classes and what we're going to cover today. I have more 10 cards just in case you can make sure you get one. Um, so let's just review. I always like to start a class that way. Um, in terms of materials, guys, chapter one, we know that in general, you have to have authority, right? And authority comes in many flavors. Um, we have authority in the form of the code, legislative authority, and we have administrative authority and judicial authority. And remember, there's a pecking order, okay? That you want to try to use the most relevant authority possible, but don't push it. Meaning, when you write a memo, over your winter break, suppose someone asks you a tax question. The notion is whether you're doing it for your winter internship or your supervisor or for a client, um, many of these get, notwithstanding that someone might say to you on a Friday afternoon, I need it by Monday on my desk, Monday morning. Bear in mind that often is the case, at least in my experience, that that memo that was needed over the weekend and they you spent the whole weekend despite being a beautiful day. Um, they call you a month later and say, hey, you know that memo you wrote? Well, uh, let's talk about it. And off the record, you really don't remember it, right? But if you take whatever you've written and you marry it to sources of authority, chances are you can quickly find out or re-familiarize yourself. If you just write down propositions without citing to authority, pretty worthless. And if you don't mind, judicial opinions are exactly the same. You don't see judges just saying, I declare this to be taxable or I declare this to be non-taxable. The whole analysis involves a series of citing to authority. So uh, seen in that light, guys, you got to do the same thing, right? And we also talked about from a policy perspective, right, from a policy perspective, that we want to make sure that the code is equitable, horizontal and vertical equity. We talked about adequacy, that there is enough revenue generated. And we talked about administrability, different attributes of the code that uh, underlying, underlie it to make it manageable. So, um, chapter one, though, I said, is not my go-to chapter in terms of asking questions or problems. Beginning in chapter two, there's a whole discussion about what is income, right? What is income? And we know, Young, that the um, operative code section is what? Say it loudly. 61. Right. Code section 61, which we know, um, Jun Ho, broad or narrow? Broad, right? Everything. All accretions to wealth. Taxable. And we saw that the breadth of code section 61 extends to all sources of income. Um, domestic income, foreign income, a legal income, any accretion to wealth, including, by way of example, treasure trust. So we looked at that. Uh, we looked at the Supreme Court case in its infancy, where if someone pays your taxes, that itself is a taxable event. If you get punitive damages, that's taxable. If you have barter exchanges, that's taxable. These are all forms of accretions to wealth. 
So take a look at those. Uh, even at the end of chapter two, though, you learn that not necessarily all accretions are taxable. So, um, Max, give us an example of in chapter two what's not taxable. And you were going to say was that yeah, yeah when you buy something in its value. Okay, we all agree here, purchases will never give rise to taxable income, right? Purchases will not give rise to taxable income. Well, what sort of accretion to wealth? Um, yes. Okay, we're going to learn soon, but that's in Chapter 3. What about in Chapter 2, Robert? Imputed income, right? And what's your authority for that proposition? Uh, Section Not going to find it in the code. <laughs> Where do you find it? Uh, uh, on uh, a dance. Dance. Revenue ruling? No, it's not in the revenue ruling. Where was it found? Ellie, do you recall? Not in the regulation. Where do we learn the proposition that certain imputed income is not taxable? Go ahead. Right, independent life insurance company, right? Young, right? It's a U.S. Supreme Court case, and we're not looking at the whole case, right? The authors who were kind, they just gave you a two or three sentence excerpt, right? And I, I told you last class that Mr. Helbring was not particularly litigious. Mr. Helbring happened to be the Commissioner of Internal Revenue for many, many years. And just so you know, over the weekend, I think I shared with you, I think I did, that I'm trying to co-author an op-ed with a former commissioner, Mark Everson, and he keeps on saying he needs the right authority, right authority. In this case, authority, he now works for a company and they need to authorize and to be able to sign off on it. So I will let you know if I have this opportunity to co-author a short op-ed with uh, a former commissioner. But it's, his name is not Elbrick Everson. If you look at um, former commissioners of Internal Revenue Service, um, Mark Everson was commissioner, like I said, <clears throat> during the Bush administration. So I'll keep you posted if that happens. That would personally be exciting for me. All right, um, and we finished chapter two. Then we moved on to chapter three, and we learned, and I said, this course, or any tax course, can cover the entirety of the code. I mean, theoretically it could, if you had a lifetime spending you know, a day per section, you get through a lot of good. Remember, your code is the abridged version, right, guys? So you're not looking at all the code sections. But I don't know if, uh, you know, people that, uh, spend a lot of time studying various uh, religious uh, books and doctrines. Uh, I don't know if you want to spend your time uh, just flipping through the code section by section. I'm not sure how productive. So through this course and other tax courses, um, we professors generally highlight those code sections that are most relevant. But then in practice, other code sections come up inevitably, and by knowing the forest, you're able to find yourself and figure out which trees belong where. So it's this course, and if you decide to pursue tax, other tax courses as well, gives you a, hopefully will give you a good lay of the land. After three, we begin the discussion of gifts and bequests, and then generally, the receipt yin of a gift, generally. Taxable or not? Not taxable. What's your authority? Just say it loudly. 102 what? A, I'll help you out, okay? And uh, Shia, is that always true? No. When is it not true?
I'm your client. Explain to me when when would a gift ever be taxable? And what does it mean for business reasons? Okay, so you're saying if it's not truly a gift, if it's not done for disinterested generosity, then it could be taxable. What's your authority, uh, Duca, for, for being taxable? To say it loudly. Is that true, James? That's a limitation. Let me just explain. 102B stands for the proposition that if you could open your code, it doesn't hurt. If I give you a gift, Paducah, of a million dollars, and then you, let's just look at 102B together. 102B, okay? 102B says that if I give Maduka a gift a million dollars, Duca takes that money and puts it in a certificate of deposit at a bank, and you get a 5% return of 50000 The 50000 would be taxable, even though it's earnings on a gift, right? Everyone agree that if you take a gift and then you subsequently earn monies on that gift, those earnings are taxed, okay? And then someone said it, I heard it, Code Section 61, Duperstein, if it's not truly a gift, it's taxable under Code Section 61, right? But Yin originally stated, and she said, gifts are generally exempt, and she had said in the, well, let me fill in words for you, Shia. In the employment context, your employer gives you a gift. James, is that taxable or not? You're getting confused, you're, and that's okay today. You're mixing in apples and oranges. Because why is it taxable? Why is a gift by your employer taxable, Doug? Right, Joe. Because it's not really a gift. Well, what's your authority? 102 um, C. Not dash. Dash means a regulation. It's 102 C. It's post section, right? Which is higher authority than a regulation. 102 C <laughs> says employer gifts. Do not qualify as gifts under 102A, so they're taxable under Code Section 61, right? But James, so, so there's no limit to the taxability of, of whatever your employer gives you. Code Section 274B refers to a limitation on deduction that if you give a business gift, that, that the um, recipient is not going to include an income, your deduction is limited to $25. So there's a big difference. One, you're talking about the person giving, and one, you're talking about the person receiving. And in tax, often your analysis, there are very different tax effects, right? And if I didn't say this on last Wednesday, I'll say it again. Don't necessarily look for symmetry, right? So the fact that something is deductible by one person or a company doesn't mean it's includable by the other. So if the company gets to deduct a contribution to your pension plan, doesn't mean you have to include it, right? Similarly, if you work for a big four or a regional company, they pay for your health care benefits, right? Your health care benefits could be what? Cost the company $30,000 a year. That looks like an accretion to your wealth, right? Is it taxable? And if you look at Code Section 106, it's deductible to your employer, Code Section 162, but it's not includable under Code Section 106. So notice, asymmetrical. So we talked about the fact that um, it's generally not taxable in the employment ta in the employment context. They may be taxable, right? 102C negates 102A. 
And um, Natalia, could that always be true in the employment context? Or is the receipt of gifts always taxable? Then you're going to hear me repeat these questions. And you guys are going to get used to this. And whether it be me or the client or your supervisor, you're going to say, what's your authority? So what's your authority? Jack, do you have authority? Not sure? Female? Uh, <clears throat> not not going to find. I, 102C stands for a general proposition that uh, 102A doesn't apply in the employment context. I'm looking for an exception to that, Joe. That 102IF2. Now, Joe, you switch around. Now we're talking about proposed regulation. 102 dash, and it's K. I'm saying, sorry, you, you, you go by what name? I, you told me this. Yeah, KB. KB. 724 C. No, no, no. Oh. He, he, it's the written proposed regulation. 102 dash 1 F, right? Which stands for the proposition, right? To tell you that if it's a natural object of your bounty, so you work for your parents' company and they give you a uh, Christmas gift or wedding gift, a graduation gift, right? And they're giving it to you not because you're employed by them, but rather because they're giving you a gift because you're their child, not going to be taxable, right? 102A would apply in that context. So you're getting a, you're getting a taste of a general rule, an exception, and an exception to the exception, right? And go up and point this out, right? This is um, on page 77 related to footnote 9, okay? Page 77, uh, you look at the material associated with footnote 9. Okay. And what's on the docket today, uh, we're going to talk and finish about this chapter. We're going to talk in detail about fringe benefits. And then time permitting, I'm going to give you a little bit of foreshadowing about getting gains and losses, chapter six. Uh, any questions on the first two classes, any of the material, anything logistic? Substantive questions like as you're going through the code, you guys, even if you had undergraduate tax, for most of you, undergraduate tax was just a series of rules. But now you're going to up the game. You're going to have to look at the code, regulations, uh, court cases. This is how tax is really practiced. It's not practiced the way it is as an undergraduate. All right, any questions? You're, you guys are good? All right, then I get the... We have a um, Supreme Court case here. And um, by the way, if, if anyone who's listening, so we have two people listening, if, if they signal something that I can't see because my back is here, just let me know. And you know, if they can't hear or there's some other issue, give me a heads up, guys. All right. We have this case, uh, Life Be Hope. All right. Um, this is not, some of these cases are, if I were the authors of this textbook, I would not have included the entirety of this case. It's, it's a hard case to read. Um, I'm not sure at the end of the day if the proposition it stands for is, it's, it's, it's an important proposition, but it's, 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 well, I know why the author is included, because anytime you have a U.S. Supreme Court case dealing with tax, it usually makes it into a case. Um, putting that issue aside, let me ask you a question. Tonight, you need some factoids to entertain your significant others, your parents, it, who knows whom. So I'll give you, here's something to ponder. Upon your demise, sorry to talk, bring up mortality on a, on a nice Wednesday, but upon your demise, or your parents' demise, 
do you have to leave your assets to anyone or can you leave it to whomever you wish? See a, a nod of a head, I guess. So, uh, Jordan, what do you do? So whoever you want. And do they have recourse against you if you disinherit them? Implicit in your response is no. Is Jordan right or wrong? Anyone say you have obligations to leave it to certain people, your assets? And just to make it easy here, let's just suppose you're worth a million bucks. Just so you're a million dollars. Do you have any obligation or can you leave it to your neighbor, best friend, your enemy, whomever you want? Or are you complete liberty? Well, who says this? I remember, like, with bank, remember, like, a... But remember, this is family. It's not business, right? <laughs> You're deaf. Nothing to do with business, last I checked. So everyone here says you can leave it to whomever? All right, Joe. Estate planning, don't you have to mention all the people close to you? I go, like, make a claim that you forgot them, so you give them, like, a little... Like whatever, like a rubber. You don't duck. have to do that. No. No, no obligation. Anyone in the room married? Two hands. Okay. Selena, you're married, right? And you disinherit your spouse. He or she is bad, and you're going to disinherit them. You give it all to your professor. Is that okay? Yeah. You just inherit your spouse. Yeah. yeah. And, and Wendy, you say not. I'm saying no because I know. You just said before yes because you agree well, that. I didn't think of that. Right, yeah, you, who, who remembers your spouse, right? I, that's different. That's a retirement account. I'm talking about in your will. What's that? Do what? You can leave it all to a girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> now, does that seem right? They're horrible. What? Did you be married to a horrible person? Selena? I think uh, it depends on... Okay. If you're in the state of New Jersey and you're in the state legislature and you want to try to keep your your people off the public rolls, right? Because having people um, you know, on, on welfare rolls is not good, right, for the fisc. It's probably going to require that the spouse has a right to something, right, because he or she otherwise could end up penniless, right? Lena leaves it all to her new friend, leaves her spouse penniless, her spouse has to turn to the state of New Jersey, right? Given that, there's something called an elective share. So you cannot, Selena, you cannot, you cannot disinherit your spouse. You can, but he or she can elect against your will and take one third of your assets. Okay? Which makes sense, right? When you think about it. If you're not married, you can leave it to whomever you want. There's no obligation. Your parents can disinherit you, but with respect to spouses, that's not possible. Um, so, again, some dinner conversation tonight, guys. Um, ladies, say to your spouse, they're safe. He'll be happy. Yeah, he'll be happy. <laughs> okay. What if it's like a prenup or something? I mean, that's different. That's then different. you can waive your right to the elected chair. And that often that happens, particularly with second marriages. You know? Uh, is, there, is, is there a reason why, like, we Charlie stars in that, you know, having babies? I, I, I'm, I'm losing. I went way over my head. What's your question? Is, is there a reason why, like, many rich people, Charlie stars, they get, like, they don't get married, but they have, like, it may be accidents. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just asking you. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. It's not because of the elective share. Oh, okay. sorry. It may just be the moment, and then. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think. Yeah. That's life, right? All right. Um, so, having said that, um, here we have a case where um, 
And again, I always draw stick diagrams. You'll see, particularly in corporate tax. But here we have someone who had, uh, I think she had five children. And unfortunately, one of her children predeceased her, survived by grandchildren. Right? And the question before the court, right before Ian dies, she leaves her entire estate to a charity, okay? Um, was left to uh, preserve the records of the earthly life of Muddy, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Christian Science Religion. Okay? And the two people challenged the validity of a will. Is it easy or hard to challenge a will? Hard. Okay, You've got to prove undue influence. It is not easy to challenge a will. And as a result of challenging the will, it's not important monetarily but suppose as a result, they each end up with $10,000, okay? So as a result of challenge, challenging the will, they were going to get zero, but as a result of challenging the will, they each receive a monetary sum, say, of $10,000 apiece, okay? What? Now, is that a bequest? You know if I leave you a million dollars, is that taxable, Nelly? Say loudly, yes or no? No. What's your authority? No. Oh, two A, right? Okay, so I can leave you a billion dollars. Taxable? Not taxable, right? Now keep in mind there's an estate tax. That's a different issue. Just like we talked about last time, that there is a possibility of a gift tax under Code Section 2501. Under Code Section 2001, there if I die with a billion dollars, my estate may owe estate tax, but you guys aren't responsible for estate tax. This is an income tax court, right? All right. So having said that, um, is this a bequest? Well, a bequest we traditionally think of as someone leaving you money. Did our decedent leave these taxpayers money? And the answer is no. They were not left any money, right? But they challenged the will, and as a result of challenging the will, they each got a monetary sum. Agreed? Should that be tax-free? Should that qualify under Code Section 102A? That was the question du jour in this case, right? Should it qualify for tax-free treatment, right? Um, Shirvan? Shirvan. Shirvan. It should or should not? Should not. Not a gift. Or... Well, it's definitely not a gift. We know that because she's dead. So it can't qualify as a gift. Does it qualify as a bequest? And where would you cite for that authority? 61 talks about it being taxable. You're saying it's taxable or not? Taxable. I apologize. So you're saying it's taxable. You say under 61. Um, David, what does this case hold? Um, so it's not taxable under 22B3. 22 what? Is that the old code or the existing code? <laughs> this is a precursor, right? Remember, this, this fact pattern, right, predates 1954 code. This is the equivalent of Code Section 102A. And in this case, though, notwithstanding what your thoughts are, the court, Supreme Court held, hey, this was a settlement. This is the same thing as a bequest. It, it, it's money that inert to these people as a result of someone's death. It should qualify for the same sort of treatment. So under 102A, it talks about gross income acquired by gift, bequest, devise, or inheritance. And the, the Supreme Court said this was tantamount to a request. So um, ultimately, it was held not to be taxable. 
Not an easy case to read, admittedly, Yervon. Um, but it did, if you read the case carefully, draw the conclusion not taxed. All right, everyone got that? Not taxed. A much easier case to read is the Waldorf v. Commissioner case. Much easier to read. So in this case, Han, do you have a chance to read it? Get there, Robert? Oscar? That's a book. All right. Nelly, you get a chance to read this? Irvine? All right, guys, just, I mean, you're going to get a lot more out of the class if you read ahead. James? All right, so picture, if you will, an attorney performs legal services for a client. All right, so picture, if you will, a lawyer says, you know what, you don't have to pay me. Instead, we'll put a clause in your will. You'll leave me the money instead. You do the bequest. Now, does that sound ethical to you? It's going to be a real conflict of interest. Okay, seriously. One thing I can say, guys, you know, when it comes to life stresses, okay, we all have stress in life, right? Unless, unless we're dead, I, I'm convinced. We all have stress. Agreed? There's just different levels, agreed? And you'll have your daily stresses, like your supervisor will say you screwed this up. On a level of one to ten, your supervisor is saying that probably a six or seven level of stress, right? If you think your job is on the line, probably a good eight, healthy eight, you're, you're really nervous. Um, if you get hit with a malpractice, okay, you're edging right towards ten, okay? It's it, you get hit with a malpractice suit, I'm telling you, guys, um, that is really uncomfortable, right? If you get hit with an ethics complaint where you may lose your license, it's off the chart, right? Picture, if you will, no offense to me, you're spending Wednesday afternoons with me, and your entire time here might be all for naught if you're stripped of your, your license, right? So if there is a meaningful ethics complaint against you and they think that, you know, it's so egregious that you may lose your license, you don't want to be there, all right? So just be careful. I mean, in this case, to me, it's very clear that an attorney who is doing legal services should not have a clause in a will leaving him or her money, right? This looks like undue influence. Okay. But let's put that issue aside, which for me personally is very hard to rub. Um, it's because it, under Code Section 61, if he got paid, that would be taxable, but if it was a request, he would have received it. But you're saying it would be taxable under 61, under 102, it would not. Exactly. Well, if he got it, exactly. Right. He got paid. I mean, you might say no one's going to hit him with fraud in this because it's not the dollar amounts involved, but it is somewhat fraudulent. Uh, Young? Yeah, I, when I was um, skimming these parts, I, I I went back to business law, and didn't we had like a section that like um, lawyer is like the agent? Oh, just tell me where so you go with that. So isn't like the agent problem? The jargon of all this. Someone, when you're performing professional services for someone. That person should be the primary beneficiary, yeah, so, not you, okay? Right. So this gets into ugly ethical grounds, but let's put aside that. Um, they're asking for a malpractice suit. They're asking for an ethics complaint because when this person dies, inevitably, her children are going to read this, and they're not going to be happy campers, right? So um, they're going to bring an ethics complaint. That would be the first thing. 
Uh, it, but again, let's put let's, from a tax perspective, right? What's the issue? Distill that down for Natalia for as a tax question. As you can see the gift, you will not be back someday. Okay, so the question is, well, it's not a gift. Remember, it's a bequest. Let's words are important, right? So, bequest. Is this qualify as a bequest, or is this mo money compensation for services rendered? Right. So you have, and we were saying diametrically opposed outcomes here. On one hand, it's taxable. On one hand, it's tax free. Right. I'll tell you to come out. What was the court decide here? Taxable or tax free? Taxable. What? Taxable. Under what code section? Yeah, no question mark at the end. Okay, code section 61, taxable. Agreed? Because it does not qualify as a true request. This is one of those, what is the substance of what happened here, not the form? The form suggests the will that it was definitely a request, right? It just looked at the will and looks like, oh, so the attorney was bequeathed X sum of dollars. But when you look at the substance, it was really a payment for services rendered, which would be tax. So you can't call a duck a swan, right? You can't dress a pig up with lipstick. There's all sorts of cliches, right? So at the end of the day, the taxpayer loses here. That's just the beginning of his problem. Right, so we're just there's judicial doctrines out there. One famous one that we're going to see repeatedly here in, in your corporate tax class is that um, the substance over form doctrine. Substance over form doctrine. Let's look at the problems. Page 86. Consider whether and whether you have the opportunity to read this material or not. Okay, to participate, let's see. Consider whether it's likely that uh, Code Section 102 applies to the following circumstances. Father leaves daughter $20,000 in his will, okay? So let's just go back, we'll go, each of you, to the left and right, we'll see Galena and Wendy. Galena first. Tax or not, Wendy, see if you agree. Not tax, well, Wendy, you agree? What's your authority? 102A, right? Father dies intestate. You know what the word intestate means, Jordan? Intestate uh, means without a will, as opposed to dying with a will. The word intestate means that the laws of, in this case, New Jersey, would dictate where the monies went, okay? So if you die intestate, that means without a will. Dies intestate and the daughter, as a result of state law, receives $20,000 real estate as an heir, tax or not. How tax is the email? Agree or disagree? I agree. What's your authority? Great. <clears throat> Talk about inheritances, right? Father leaves several members, family members, out of his will, and daughter and others tax the will. As a result of a settlement of uh, the controversy, daughter receives 20000 On Justin, tax or not? Justin agrees? You got so quickly? Yeah, no. One? Taxable, you say what? No taxable. What's your authority? You would say 102A, but you would also. If you have authority on point, guys, it never hurts to cite to another source. So I would, where the, I'm the client, or excuse me, where I'm doing this for a client, I cite to code section 102A, and I would cite to like the hoeing, right? Because this way becomes much more compelling. You have a code um, section, plus you have a U.S. Supreme Court case, right? So that's pretty, pretty authoritative. So not taxable. Go ahead, Vima. Uh, going back to question, question B, uh, you said that intestate means that it dies without a will. Right. 
And then who did you say determines where the state, whatever state you're domiciled in. Uh, okay, and they, they it generally it goes to your spouse if it's your first marriage, no spouse, then it goes to your children in equal shares. What you would think, but sometimes you know, people don't want to leave it equally to their children, mm -hmm. that's what you need a will for. Okay, and then do they decide, they decide that it's equally distributed? If there's no spouse. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Question eight. Father leaves his daughter twenty thousand dollars in his will, stating that the amount is in appreciation daughter's long and devoted service to him. In this case, uh, Robert, Oscar, tax or not? Uh, yes, I believe. Are we saying that she provided a service to, to, to her father, like an actual service, or was she saying in service to him? So there's some ambiguity. Yes, Oscar, exactly. you agree? Tax or not? Yes. That's right? I'm saying yes. We're saying tax. Not sure. If you say it's taxable, Robert, what code section? I would say it's taxable under um, code section 61. All right, so. We're all going to agree that this question has some ambiguity. I'm not trying to make your notes confusing. But does everyone understand? We don't know if the lawyer who drafted this just added some flowery language or the exactly. daughter truly performed services. In contrast to problem E, let's look at that. Right. Father leaves daughter $20,000 pursuant to a written agreement under which daughter agreed to care for father in his declining years. That makes a nice juxtaposition because in this case, that has the aroma, right, of being taxable. All right, be Hoey or? No, the, the Oh, yeah, yeah sure. Or be commissioner. Yeah, I think we're going to get to that. But in this case, um, you know, truly services were being rendered. You perform services taxable under Code Section 61, right? Yeah, but I mean, some really take care and some change bedpans and other people hire nurses and others to, to do the dirty work, right? So you got to find out why is father doing this in his will, right? Question F. Same as any, except father died in testing and daughter successfully enforced a $20,000 claim uh, under the agreement against the estate. So in this case, you know, Tax or not, Shervon, uh, see if you agree. A non tax Shervon, agree or disagree? If you say agree, what's your authority? Section 102A, do you have any other authority? Holly, do you have any other authority? Bernie? Um, you can use the, uh, question F? Oh, I'm looking at E. So question F, we're saying, James? I think it's taxable if you still use it. All right, question F. Um, yes. We're going back to E, except um, he died in test um, I Let me just put it this way. Question F, just for clarity. Since the father, it shouldn't matter if he does not with a will or without a will, if she's enforcing a claim for services rendered, Section 61 would make this tax. Right? Question G, same as um, question F, except the daughter settles for $20,000 claim, $10,000. And the monetary amounts don't matter, right? There's no de minimis threshold or anything like that. So. Your answers for it, E, F, and G should all be the same. Yes, go to question. Ten thousand, whatever she gets. She's not going to be taxed on fans of me. Max? Yes. Can you go over F one more time? Why is that taxable? Well, if she truly performs services. Is being compensated vis-a-vis -vis the will. 
father could have just written her a check for twenty thousand. He happened to die, and he, he left the same amount in the will. So generally, if you're being co compensated for services, that's not truly in the nature of the bequest. Name B one more time. B. Um, I can't explain explain it. All I'm saying is. We're not sure if the daughter really performed services or if this was just the lawyer being very generous with the use of the language. We need to know more facts. And periodically, you're going to have questions like this that the authors present where we would need, as practitioners, we would turn to our clients and say, can you elaborate, right? Question eight, <laughs> father appoints the daughter as executrix of his estate. The father's will provided daughter was to receive twenty thousand dollars for services as executrix. So the role of an executrix is to um, pay all the debts, collect all the assets, and then make distributions in accordance with the terms of a will. It takes lots of hours of work to do. But generally, executor commissions are taxable to function in the role of an executor. It's a time-consuming fiduciary responsibility. Um, it's taxable. Go ahead, Robert. If I'm the executor of, let's say, my mother's estate, but I'm also one of the beneficiaries of her estate, what portion? Well, I'm here's my question to you, Robert. If your mom, suppose you have one sibling, okay, right. and the estate has one million twenty thousand dollars. If you get the first twenty thousand, then you and your brother split the balance right. fifty fifty, then the twenty thousand to me like would be taxed. Okay? All right, so okay, I see what you mean. Sorry. Okay. Father appointed his daughter executrix of the estate, made a twenty thousand dollar bequest to her in lieu of all compensation or commissions to which she would otherwise be entitled as executrix. So Again, not to be ambiguous with your notes, and you wouldn't see a, an exam question like this, but in question H and I, um, it's not a particularly, question H, it's pretty clear she's getting the $20,000 for services rendered. Question I is saying, gee, I'm going to give you an extra 20000 but it's not entirely clear if, if that's for services rendered. So, John. You, you may say the same question as you had in D, and I'm not trying to be purposely and evasive here, but it's not a, this, this could go either way. It might qualify as a request under 102A. Um, it might be taxable under Section 61. We'd like to know more facts, all right? All right, question two. Boyfriend who has a quote unquote mental problem with marriage agrees with tax payer that he will leave her quote unquote everything at his death in return for staying with him without marriage. She does, he doesn't. She sues his estate on the theory of quantum merit and settles her claim. Is her settlement excludable under Section 102? Friend, you're shaking your head. <coughs> Do, do, do you know, can you explain to the class, what is quantum narrow with me? Important to know? Anyone look it up? <laughs> Say again? Okay, so the Latin translation. Anyone Google it? I have Google. Anyone surfing the net, not looking at me? What? Tell me. What one is earned? Okay, what one is earned for services rendered, right? Really. What the word earned connotes, right? Earn connotes that you did something, right? Thing yeah. into whatever quote unquote services you rendered to this guy. Um, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So section sixty one. So section sixty one suggests, right? That it's he's suing under a contractual theory that she performs services, right, guys? Well, if you sue under that theory, guess what? You're going to have tax billing. Under a theory of services rendered, you're going to have tax billing. 
Section 61. 102C is of recent vintage, was enacted after the Waldorf case. Um, if the Waldorf case arose today, would 102C apply? So, um, yes, would it apply? Go see if you agree. <coughs> um. Why don't you see wood apply? And Joe, would you agree? Um, I don't know because we would have to know if he did it out of just uh, out of. <coughs> what do we, John? I think it doesn't apply because he's not an uh, employee. He's an agent. He's not an agent. I think you're I mean, fixated on an agent. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think, but he's not employee. Well, we know a different word. Let's use our our language. What would you call him, Jordan? But what is he? I knew that too, but oh, I <laughs> knew that. He's an independent contractor, right? Oh, yeah. Right? And does Code Section 102C apply to independent contractors? It applies in the employment context. This is not the employment context. So 102C would not help resolve this issue. You have to turn to a case like Duberstein, right? See if this was done out of disinterested generosity, which it was not, right? So the point, why do the authors have this? Because you got to write, apply the right code section. Suppose you gave a memo to your supervisor, Jiang, in a fact pattern similar to the Walter decision, in which you said it's code section 102C. Would that be a good day in your office? No, it would not be. Yeah. I would never have a question. No. What if the lawyer, what if she did have a lawyer, but if she was an employee of hers? Well, then she left. It, it's really, what context? I, just give me a scenario. General counsel and she owned the company? Yeah. And, and, and served the aroma. You guys, how many of you haven't seen it? A fun movie, I think. Um, Ratatouille. You guys see the Ratatouille? He's always trying to get the aroma. Uh, so, in tax, once in a while, guys, if you haven't seen Rat Test Tui, that's one of your work assignments. Uh, but go see it because certain things have an aroma. You just don't, you know, they're not, they're not on all fours, but you get an aroma that it smells good or it smells bad. All right? Ready to take chapter four, guys? Chapter four deals with just the authors are going to give us a taste of those. Another case, you look at 102, we're going to get another case of things which are uh, not taxable, notwithstanding that there's an increase in wealth. Because in the absence of Code Section 102, if you receive the gift or request, it would be taxable. Uh, but we have Code Section 102. Similarly, fringe benefits right, are taxable. So let's start with the proposition that all fringe benefits except those enumerated in the code are taxable. And if my memory serves me correctly, I believe that's Regulation 61-21. It just says, affirms, yeah, 61-21, the regulations say, essentially, except as otherwise provided, the receipt of fringe benefits are taxed by the regulation. Okay, anytime you hear me use Dash, which denotes a regulation. And for years, there was confusion. How should French benefits be taxed? And finally, in 1984, Congress took action that we got to spell this out. Got to make the code more administrable. So I think it makes sense, if you don't mind me doing this, let's take a look together, if you could, everyone, hopefully everyone now has a copy of the code, right? They would not get this yet. I'm coming in the mail. All right. Yeah. Hopefully you'll get it soon, very soon. All right. I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. 
Um, everyone could open up to code section 132. Everyone have it? I said, gross income shall not include any fringe benefit which qualifies, and there's a list here of seven different benefits, right? Seven different benefits which would qualify for non-tax treatment, right? And if you look at 132A, it doesn't really elaborate. It says 132A1, no additional cost service. What does that mean? Not clear. So good news, and this is often the case in the code, is if you keep reading, things are answered. So let's take a look at 132B. It defines no additional cost service. For the purpose of this section, the term no additional cost service means any service provided by an employer to an employee or used by such employee if such service is offered in, in for sale to customers in the ordinary course of the, um, of the line of business of the employer in which the employee is performing services and the employer incurs no substantial additional cost. But that's a no additional cost service. Um, who here in this class who has had the experience of a no additional cost? French benefit. Anyone? Kelly? Uh, oh, yeah, they have a um, store where they sell their products at the cost. That's not, that's a product, that's not a service. Oh, Anyone here have a service, no additional cost service? Go ahead, Robert. Would that be like if you work at an office and they have a coffee machine that customers can eat? That's that uh, not it. It's not a service that they normally provide. So there. Something new. Okay. I mean, I, I can raise my hand. Uh, when I was uh, in college one summer, I worked at New Jersey Transit. And I guess what? I show my employee ID card and ride the train and bus for free. Right? So um, some of you may have friends who are pilots, for example. And they can... Um, Ride the plane, ride a plane for free, right? And that's a nice French benefit, right? The round trip plane flight to Singapore is a few thousand dollars. They pay no tax on that, James. Okay, no additional cost service, right? All right, 102C. Excuse me, 132C, I should say. Qualified employee discounts, okay? If you receive property, as long as it was not, um, you got a discount that was not in excess of the gross profit percentage, there's no income. In the case of services, as long as 20% of the price for the services are being offered um, uh, by the employer to customers, okay? So up to 20% um, of the services uh, which are the employer offers to customers that would not be taxable. If you look at 132C2, it defines what is the gross profit percentage. And we're going to see a problem looking at this. Okay? Not, not going to be too hard. Okay? Anyone in this room? The benefactor of a qualified employee discount. Work for Macy's. Okay, you work for Macy's, and what was your discount? I got 20%. 20% off. Anyone else work for retail? Anything else? All right. I worked at a Nike outlet. Got like 30% off. 30%. Okay. Anyone else can up the ante? Selena? I only gave 30%. Okay, give me more. Oh. Pardon? Yeah, retail. Where did you work? Okay. When I used to work for Lexata Guy. What company? Luxottica. So what? Lens Crafter, Sunglass Hut. So okay. I used to get 60% off. Wow. Um, I, I'm going to mispronounce it. Razia. Razia. Amazon. 10%. 10%? Amazon? Okay. All right. And 
Previously, you probably didn't know that some of these are pretty generous benefits, but they taxable, right? But they're not. Okay? Why? We have authority. Um, working condition fringe benefits, not taxable. Working condition fringe benefits are things like free Xeroxing, right? Um, if if um, you get good lighting, good computers, good air conditioning, these are all working condition fringe benefits that normally you could deduct if you yourself were incurring the expense in business. Working condition fringe benefits. The minimum is fringe benefits. Okay? So the boss gives you a bottle of water. You know, you get a tank of water, you can get full and natural spring water, free coffee, free donuts, the minimums, right? Not taxable. Qualified uh, transportation fringe benefits. Okay, defined in 132F, there's certain uh, things that you can get that will qualify. There are some limitations, some limitations. Um, for example, uh, if you look at qualified parking, um, if I can find it quickly, which I can't find that quickly. I'll find it in a moment. Um, no, no, I see it. Oh, I, I, no, no, what I was looking for is um, the $175 per month. Um, if you look at uh, the limitations under F2, uh, the limitations are $175 per month under subparagraph A for free parking. Uh, the Wall Street Journal years and years ago ran a piece. What do you think it costs to park your car in Washington, D.C. in the year this law was enacted? The average parking, monthly parking space was 175 So Congress had to come up with a number and came up with a number. All right. Not surprising. All right. Um, so there's whole bunch of fringe benefits. Now, look at 132H. So once the code enumerates the fringe benefits, let's just look at 132H. But so do fringe benefits extend beyond the taxpayer? And the answer is yes. They extend to employees as well. When I say employees, I should say. Uh, retired and disabled employees and surviving spouses of employees are treated as employees. That's for purposes of paragraph one and two of subsection A. And spouse and dependent children also get to enjoy the benefits of 132A1 and A2. If you look at reciprocal agreements, in the case of 132A1, okay, with respect to no additional cost services, and a reciprocal agreement. And notice that there's an anti-discrimination rule. You look at 132J1, okay, where the benefits with respect to a1 and A2 cannot be discriminatory. Well, when I say that, if they are discriminatory, the benefit is taxable to the highly compensated employee. So, for example, if highly compensated employees on airlines can fly for free, but the rank and file have to pay, in that case, it would that would be taxable. The, the the price, the airline ticket price, would be taxable. So there there can be discrimination, but it, when it comes to 132A1 and A2, if it is discriminatory, it becomes taxable to the highly compensated. By way of contrast, most of us are imposed to discrimination for a good reason, right? But a fringe benefits, right? That's not under 132A1 or A2, right? It's under 132, I think, uh, A5. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, which one is it? A. Is 
the other 84. Okay? And suppose the highly compensated get Starbucks coffee, but the rank and file get mud water, right? So it's discriminatory, right? Those in the upper tier get the good coffee, the ones at the bottom you know, get really awful coffee. Does that make it taxable? And the answer is no, because those anti-discrimination rules only apply to no additional cost services and qualified employee discounts. And there's also, you'll see, it applies to eating facilities and one or two others. But it does not, those anti-discrimination rules apply universally. So, for example, in many accounting firms and law firms, who gets the free parking? The, part, the boss, the partner. Who has to pay for the parking? Those least able to afford it, the secretaries and the mail staff, right? Discriminatory. Does it make it taxable? No, because that's not under uh, that limitation. And um, there's also, um, uh, we will see. Um, First of all, there is a um, rule that permits gyms, for example, as long as they're on-premises gyms, generally not taxable, 132J4. Some of you at your firms are going to have gyms, right, which is pretty valuable. Membership to a gym can cost $100, $200 a month, right? Not taxable. Come on. How, anyone here belong or know friends who belong to Equinox? Tell oh, you, you belong? How much is it? Do you mind? I don't want to be too guilty. 250 a month? Do they wash your feet as you leave the firm? <laughs> I mean, why is it so much? Hi. Okay. Aside from it being nice, a lot of gyms are nice, but what different, what led you to choose that versus, are the classes free? I'm sorry? It's very clean and like the machines are new. Classes are. They have like different classes, a lot of classes throughout the day yoga, Pilates, cardio classes. Right. So it makes it worth your while. Presumably you use it because you're spending so much money. Yeah, it actually makes you go there more often than I. <laughs> if you don't, you feel very guilty, right? One would hope so. All right. So what the authors do, uh, beginning on page 93, is to elaborate the meaning of, you know, we were just flipping through the code. The authors elaborate and hopefully give you a good idea of what, a bit more detail, each of these fringe benefits and how they operate. Okay, so these are the ones that you would be held accountable for. But they don't give you all the French benefits, they give you the major ones. So let's do this. Let's begin the problem on page 99 unless you guys have any specific questions. Completely statutory. But it's what? Completely statutory. I, I think, and I don't know if you want to show me the page number. In my mind, completely statutory means um, the authority is tied up in the code. It's not a regulatory, it's not judicial, completely statutory nature. Um, so if you were citing to authority, you just rely on the statute itself. Any other questions? All right. Um, let's do the problem um, on, again, page 99. And again, you guys hopefully don't mind my methodology, which is uh, just to try to get people involved. And I do not, I promise you, go back to my office. If you don't get it right, so be it uh, onward or forward. Um, so don't get frazzled or lose sleep about it, but um, I just want to hear your voices as opposed to just hearing my voice. So Raza, you take problem 1A, 
employee of a national hotel chain, stays in one of the chain hotels for in another town, rent free while on vacation. Hotel has several empty rooms. Tax or not? And Kyle, see if you agree. Again? Taxable. What would be your authority? So that would be a regulatory site, right? Regulation 61-21. Kyle, would you agree? Not taxable on your... David, I'm going to have to ask of your two neighbors who's right. Um, not taxable under 130. Is that the best you can offer in terms of the site? James, could you offer a better site? I'm not trying to be. No? What might you say for a client? Lost with this one. Lost, Tiong? So I would say 132B2. Uh, All right. Because let's, let's start. 132A1 just says no additional cost service, right? Well, that says something, but to know more, I would say to 132A1 plus 132B, because 132B elaborates what is a no additional cost service, right? Yeah. This is, for us, the quintessential no additional cost service, right? It's the empty rooms. Empty rooms. Joe, what do you lost? Um, What's the problem? I just don't understand what it's at. What, what, what? I don't understand. So are, are fringe benefits taxable or not? Are, yes. are some, yeah. yeah. Generally, it starts off with Regulation 61-21, which says all fringe benefits are tax, taxable, except as otherwise provided. And 132 elaborates those that are not taxable. Okay, so it's taxable unless it, it's in the codification there. Okay. Getting like it's fine. I mean, guys, by the way, let me just make an observation, and I'm sorry. This sounds pedantic. It sounds paternalistic. There's probably a few other. When you talk to your supervisor, there are cliches that you got to stay away from, which are, you may have heard, every question is a good question. No, not true, right? When you talk to your supervisor, um, they have to be well thought out. And Joe, I'm not. Don't don't read between the lines. I'm not suggesting I'm using you. But, um, just try to articulate. And, and again, I'm not picking. I'm not even saying this, this is just stream of consciousness. But careful when you talk during your internship. And all that's just talking about tax. I mean, no offense to me. I hope I'm, several of you are not going to go into tax. You're going to go into auditing. And you're going to have questions. Just don't don't use stream of consciousness and just ask your questions, okay? Um, just you got to have thoughtful questions because that's what's going to keep you employed. There's nothing wrong with a thoughtful question, but bantering your supervisor with sort of silly questions is not going to win you any brownie points. Along the same lines, Young, and then I'll take when you go for lunch and you do other things with every time you go out with associates at the firm. When they get back, they have to fill out an evaluation for them, right? There's no time for you to let down your defenses, guys. No time to order the long spaghetti and get it all over yourself, okay? So just cautionary note, just every time you go out with someone, um, chances are going to fill out an evaluation of you. So just careful, John. Uh, can you, um, I, I, got, I got some kind of like logic in while well, reading if it's kind of correct. Well, you say it's correct? Yeah. I mean, the Bible. Do you question the Bible? No, 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 no. I mean, I'm, my, my logic. Not, not the Bible itself. Okay, what's, what's your so, answer? So, um, you, know, you know, in 132B, they said no substantial additional cost. So, substantial, they mentioned substantial because <laughs> even we, if we 
less employees using the empty room, it's going to still cost like a like very small. Yeah, but that's, that's not, I mean, there may be a difference of opinion, but we know that's not a substantial cost. And there's no, there's nothing in the regulations that elaborates. That's oh, going to okay. be a jury of our peers to decide what, what substantial and what's not, okay? So there are oh, going to be okay. terms of art that are not going to be defined. And again, thinking about the movie Ratatouille, you can get an aroma of what is and what is not substantial, right? I didn't know that. Sorry. All right. Now you do. Yeah. Okay. So for your notes, question A, not taxable. All right. Joe, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, James? <coughs> All right. Let me just, and feel free to chime in, James, but let me ask KB. Question B, and Max, see if you agree, agree with KB. Uh, same as A, except that the guest <coughs> clerk balances the paying guest, so employee can stay rent free. Tax or not? Ambiguous again, because we don't. I'm sorry? Ambiguous, because travel with them around. Max, is it ambiguous? I would say it's a little ambiguous. And Natalia, do you agree? Say not tax. But you can't I'm the client, you can't hesitate like that. You either is or isn't. Contact one three two three. Go ahead. Because you have to kick out the paying customer, which is the cost. Right. Well, I agree. Yeah, the regulation makes clear. If you got a work bit of paying client guys, it does not qualify. That would be section 132B. Because it's uh, yeah. substantial. No, it's a 132. Well, what is it taxable under, Kyle? Uh, taxable under section Right, taxable under code section 61 because the regulatory site, guys, by the way, for exams and for clients, they never come in with a regulation tattooed to their forehead. So you're going to have a hard time. In this case, the authors were very kind to you, right? They gave you 132.82 and says, if you look at regulation 132-2A, that's what the author cited you to. Services that are eligible for treatment for no additional cost services include excess capacity services and hotel accommodations and elaborate. David. <laughs> I just texted him. You did? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, in any event, um, yeah. if you look at the regulatory site, guys, this would not qualify. Talia, you got to pick out a pick out a pain. You're losing significant money. It's coming at a significant price tag to you. So, right, Kyle, taxable, Code Section 61. Question C. Same day, except that employee pays the bill and receives a cash reimbursement or cash rebate from the chain. So here, let's say the hotel room were $100. And after it's Motel 6, employee stays there and it gets back 100 bucks. Taxable or not? It's cash reimbursement. Taxable. What's your authority? Yeah, but did you look at this regulatory site? No, did you look at in question C, the 132-2A3? Look there? Want to look there? Never mind, you can't be looking there. I can tell you that. You got to look at the back of your book. You got to look at the regulation. The 132. Oh, Find that regulation. Find it. Uh, 
फिर आम है Did everyone find it? If you don't, guys, this week, last week, and this week, if you don't find it, it's okay. You're just learning it, okay? That's okay. But in the next two weeks, if you can't find your regulation, that's going to be a problem, right? Because if you read this regulation, which again, the authors are going to be far kinder. Your supervisor is not going to tell you what regulation to go to. I can promise you that. And what does this regulation say, Raz? It's tax or not? You have the regulation in front of you, Jordan? Um, it's not taxable. Yeah, it's excluded, which makes sense, right? If you're selling in Motel Six and you have to spend money, but there's empty hotel rooms, and then your employer reimburses you, it's the exact same thing as if you spend nothing, right? Why should the answer in A and C be any different? Right? But be careful, guys. For exams, I can ask these questions, and you really got to know this stuff, right? And it's open book, which means all the answers are going to be right there. You just have to know how to find them. Question D. James A. accept that employee spouse and dependent children traveling without employee use the room on their vacation. So that's a nice perk. Everyone agree? So in this case, um, let me go young and um, I get people's names. Uh, James, non taxable or not? Uh, it's non taxable. James, agree or disagree? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I actually found it. Jack, you were going to say? Uh, non taxable. But what's your authority? Uh, I'm saying 132B. It's not going to help you because they're not employed by the company. But it applies to spouses and children. Well, you got to give me the authority. No? Say 132H? Yeah, 132H. Right? You need to tie it together, Jack. In other words, I would say to 132B coupled with 132H. Okay? At the risk of repetition, guys, I am as a, as a, I am the antithesis of a foodie. Okay? The antithesis. I don't really care uh, what I eat. Um, Vegetarian for 30 plus years, but I am a big peanut butter and jelly fan. So I always refer to things as peanut butter and jelly, things that, in my mind, like peanut butter and jelly, they belong together. Any other peanut butter and jelly fans out there? We're up on it. All right. I mean, is there anything better? Can I add? All right. That's mana from the heavens, right? Um, and if you don't know the word, I'll just, I, I, I like words. So here's another word if you your vocabulary. Does anyone know what ambrosia means? Yeah. What? The food of God. The food of the gods, right? So, ambrosia. Peanut butter and jelly, okay? <laughs> so, in this case, the peanut butter and jelly is 132B coupled with 132H, right? They go together in this particular in response. All right, question E. Same as A, except that employee stays at the hotel for rival chain under a written reciprocal agreement, which employees pay 50% of the normal rent. Uh, Maduka and um, Maduka and uh, Shia, taxable or not? Not taxable, Shia, agree? What's your authority? 132I. Couple with 132B, uh, right? For no additional cost service with a reciprocal agreement, right? So this would work. Even if you work for Marriott and you're staying at um, Hampton Inn, or not, Marriott doesn't own Hampton Inn, um, and they have a reciprocal agreement, then it would not be taxable, right? Are we good with that? Not taxable. Person F. Same as A, 
that the employee is an officer of a hotel chain and rent-free use is provided only to officers of the chain and all other employees pay 60%. So the, high, the officers get to go for free and people like us, the hoi polloi, uh, have to pay 60%. In my, my Hotel 6 example, we'd have to pay $60, okay? So in that case, Yin and Galena, taxable or not? Taxable, Galena, agree? Is your authority, Galena? Okay, again, Yin? Galena, 132J? That completes the puzzle, Yin? Is that it? Your final answer? <coughs> N61, right? Because 132J just says if it's discriminatory, it doesn't qualify for the highly compensated. That just means that it doesn't qualify, it would be taxable then under Code Section 61, right? Okay. Question G. Hotel chain is owned by a conglomerate, which also owns a shipping line. The facts are the same as in A, except the employee works for the shipping line. Taxable or not taxable? In this case, Wendy and Jordan. So Jordan, you say it's in Vimo. Do you have a thought here? I also think it's taxable. Um, What's the language of 132B? Look at 132B1. 132B1 says such service is offered for sale to customers in the ordinary course of the line of business of the employer. Okay, so it's supposed to be the line of business of the employer. This is not the same line of business, right? So this would be taxable, but there's in 61. This is not the same line of business. It doesn't qualify under 132B. Question H. Same as G, except now the employee is the controller of the con conglomerate. So sort of works on multiple lines of business. On, taxable, or not? And he's not taxable. Justin, would you agree? be not taxable. Right. Han, what's your authority? Again? Uh, okay. I don't, don't think this is the wrong way. Um, I get a little punchy up. That's going to be kind of lame authority. Do you have any better authority? All right. Let's say it's not taxable, but do we have authority? That would make me sleep at night, right? Han, you want to sleep at night, right? We all want, right? When we leave from work, don't we all want to sleep at night? You don't want to be unnerved that you gave the wrong answer to a client or supervisor. Agreed? You're going to sleep tonight, Han, if you just cite to 132. Okay. Is that going to be your ambient? Anyone has some ambient on it? <laughs> Not the drugs. Authority. To me, that's the same thing. Because I like sleeping at night. Where are you reading from? Regulation 132. All right. So where did you get that regulatory site? Well, they told you, right, guys? 
The authors here are far kinder. I keep saying it. The authors cite you to a regulatory site, right? What does that regulatory site say? An employer is treated as performing substantial service in all such lines of business. Ah, uh, stop there. Okay. So if you look at that, in other words, here's regulatory authority, right, Hans? You see this regulatory authority? It says this person is deemed to be in all those different lines of business, right? Yeah. Is that good ambient to sleep at night? Work ambient. Wouldn't you sleep much better if you had that? And you could cite to that? Absolutely. Question I. Employee sells insurance, an employer insurance company allows employee 20% discount off the thousand hour cost of the policy. Okay? So, in that case, um, I don't know if it left off Robert, Oscar, tax or not. Uh, that's Oscar agrees. Just point out to you. you look at third footnote thirty-five on page ninety-four. Look at look at the sentence. It's um that has footnote thirty-four and thirty-five. Purchases of services include the, in the legislative history indicates. Purchases of life insurance policy. Purchases of life insurance policy. That's page 94? Yeah. So no, 34 or 35. You guys in the right edition of the book? Uh, 19th, 19th edition? 19th edition. Yeah. You see footnote 34 and 35? Oh, I know. Oh, okay. All right, so life insurance is deemed, the sale of life insurance is deemed, um, um, includes life insurance policy. So you can get a 20% discount. You can cite, look at thir you know, 34 and 35, there's a case, there's legislative history. That that qualifies for employee disqualified employee discounts relating to services, so this would be not taxable. Not taxable. Question J. Employee is a salesman in a home furnishing store. The prior year, the store had a million dollars in sales. $600,000 cost of goods sold. Employee buys a $2,000 sofa from, from employer for $1,000. So in this case, you know, uh, share bonds, tax for or not? You see that um, we're just in problem J. Now you can see if you agree or not. You know? Employee control, so. Qualified employee discount, right? Yeah. All the, how much is tax for? So I don't know. But this one is more than 20%. 20% relates to the services, the, the sale of goods, right? What percentage is tax free? Where did you enter hand up? You say 400 is tax. Nelly, you agree? Disagree? What's the gross profit percentage here? Uh, 40%. 40%. How'd you get 40%? About 1 million minus 600. So, you have 1 million minus $600,000, right? That represents the profit over the total goods sold. That equals 40 percent. Everyone agree? So remember, under um, under the code, we go back to code section 132. Okay. 
132C says that a qualified fringe benefit can equal the amount of the um, gross profit percentage, right? And that's defined 132C2. So on this purchase of $2,000, right, the sofa costs $2,000, agreed? Discount that's not taxable would be the first $800, right? Where did I get that? 40% times 2,000. Any discount in excess of that, what's the excess? $200, right? That $200 would remain taxable under Code Section 61. Reach over the 40%. Excellent. 132C2 defines the gross profit percentage, which is this fraction. Okay? For that, uh, so just check. So 132CB, that's just for service. But there's no such thing as 132CB. Uh, B1B. B1B. Yeah, that's just for service. Yeah, it's not product. It's just the service. Okay. Question K. Employee attends a business convention in another town. Employer picks up employee's cost. So let's say you have to attend a business conference in NOLA. Who knows where NOLA is? New Orleans. Louisiana. It always goes by NOLA. Okay. Your employer sends you to NOLA, taxable or not, picks up the entire tab. In that particular case, David, taxable or not? No. Uh, but excluded. Excluded for what? Why? For, for, I, don't have a, I don't have a good connection. Hello, 132A5. What? Say loudly. 132A5. Which relates to what? By transportation. By transportation. Rather? If you say it's excluded, you have to have a reason. Yeah? Yeah, 132D, I think. Which is what? Working condition fringe. Yeah, it's working condition fringe. Like if this was your own company, you had to pay for the trip, you could deduct it as an ordinary necessary business. Okay. You'll see 162 defines expenses and says what are necessary are deductible. Okay? Next. Uh, employer of the forum provides employees with happy hour cocktails at the end of each work week. So, taxable or not? And Jan, see if you agree. So, taxable? You like the Roman gladiators. Thumbs up or thumbs down? I don't think it's taxable. You say it's not taxable? Yeah. Jan, correct? Yes. What's your authority? 132A. What specifically? Um, uh, benefits. But fringe says a lot. You got to be more specific for a client, supervisor, whomever. Right. Oh, I was gonna, oh, yeah, I was going to say 132A is warned de minimis fringe. De minimis, right? De minimis fringe benefit, right? From an administrative point of view, right, Kyle? Is it, would it be really hard for the government to tax this? Right? Is anyone going to stand when you get your cocktails and say, well, if you had two cocktails tonight, you're taxable on $10. Oh, you had three, we're going to tax you on $15, right? Just administratively, it seems like a real problem to make this taxable. So, not taxable. Everyone agree? The minimum fringe benefit. Uh, by the way, another message here. Sorry. Um, if, you're, if you go out to lunch, I don't, my opinion, sorry, everyone else orders drink, guys, for, for your internship, don't order drink, all right? Just don't do it, okay? Just get yourself into trouble. 
All right. Um, employer gives employees a case of scotchy Christmas. Ask for or not. Say that quickly. Why, why not tax for? Because uh, it's also de minimis. 132A4. Justin, you agree? Yeah, I, I agree. Low value holiday gift. All right. But are any Scotch drinkers out here? Robert, tell us more. Aren't there like red labels, blue labels, all sorts of labels out there? From price point. So, like. And what do you drink, Robert? I drink Yamazaki. <coughs> so, no, that goes. Four hundred dollars a bottle, more or less. That's my favorite. Out of my league, I. <laughs> but like, if. You so if you got a case of that, Robert, you'd be a happy camper, right? I'd be ecstatic, but I. How many How many bottles in a case, Robert? I've never purchased a case, so it's like what six. So if the bottles normally cost four hundred dollars, and you get a case. Last I did my arithmetic, that's twenty four hundred bucks. That's a minimus. No. no. Oh, what? It depends on the materiality of the company. Well, no, it doesn't depend on the materiality, I don't think, of the company. Um, isn't, isn't it taxable because it's, it's not a gift of generosity, it's a part of like a company? Yeah, but, but it, go ahead, James. I'm going to say there's a little ambiguity, but it's scotch is low market value. Yeah, I'm if it's, say it's, Jay, it's the only kind of scotch, it's probably cheap garbage. James Keller stuff. Because traditional holiday, <laughs> birthday, or holiday. Yeah, it's going to be work for traditional, but if, it, if it's Robert quality, then it probably would be taxable, okay? So, you said we can't young, this is going to drive you nuts. <laughs> yeah. But it could go either way. All right? So, so we, we need right to know more facts. And the fact you can only do that, that has nothing to do with it. All right, the, the point I'm making, guys, again, in tax, the interesting questions are those that don't have clear answers, and you have to work it out with your client and see their risk tolerance and point out the risk because you don't want to be the guarantor and say it's not taxable. You have to point out the pros and cons. At some point, the client has to make the decision, not you. Right, Rob. Do you utilize something like the nature of the transaction or the type of client that you work with to justify whether it's... I, I think, and that was Nellie's point, I don't care if you work for Amazon or if you work for a mom and pop store, the receipt of a scotch is going to dictate if it's de minimis or not. You shouldn't have the tax effects depend on who the employer is. That's going to create a really ugly expectation. All right, um, question in. Employees and officer of a company that pays employees parking fees um, at a lot, one block from corporate headquarters, non-officers pay their own parking. In that case, would that be taxable or not? Paducah, taxable or not? Just say it loudly. Not taxable. Not taxable. And KB, would you agree? One, three, five. Okay, but. KB, do you have better authority than 132A5? Duca. 132F, right? KB, elaborate the meaning of qualified transportation free. And we see that parking, right, up to a $175 threshold would not be taxable, even though it's discriminatory, which might be aggravating, but Aggravating doesn't mean it's taxable, right? Don't confuse the two. Question O. Employer provides employee with $185 worth of voucher refund for commuting on public mass transportation system. Taxable or not in this particular instance? Would this be taxable? You know, you look like you're chomping at the bits to give us an answer here. Uh, <laughs> yes. All of it? Uh, no, uh, just ten dollars. Why ten dollars? Uh, because under code section one thirty two F, it limits seventy five dollars. Right. A month. You, so anything above one seventy five is taxable under what code section? One thirty two F. Sixty one. Sixty one. Oh, the oh, sixty one. Oh, yeah. All right, so the first 175, not taxable, 132F. 
Anything above that, in this case, $10 or $120 for the year, right? Unless I did my math, $10 a month times 12. You can all handle that. Um, $120 would be included in gross income, right? Performing your own income taxes, you have to like you have to break down all the. Well, the employer has a responsibility to issue you a W. This would probably be included in the employee's wages. So the taxable fringe benefit would end up on that employee's W-2. Now, if you get issued just as a matter of fact, James, an incorrect W-2, you don't, your tax outcomes are not dictated by W-2s. That's just an information return. So if your employer blows it, in theory, and doesn't include this as income, you have a responsibility to report it anyway. But that's a different issue. As a practical matter, for exam purposes, I would say you're supposed to report it because, again, what an employer issues you in the form of an information return doesn't dictate the tax outcome. So we have an obligation as employees to do that employer filled out. Absolutely. Right? You can't just, if you get a, a, a flawed W 2, you can't say, oh, I just, re if you know you made 300000 and your employer, Mistakenly shows thirty thousand. Clearly, uh, you're at fault. Last trust. What happens when they reimburse it? Let's see. We can use the property to sell ten times. We go to the client. We can use fifty times. Yeah, but generally, reimbursement of fault of a business expense is not taxed. Not taxed. Let's do this last question, guys. Yeah. The uh, employer put the gym at a business facility for use by the employees and their families. Taxable or not? Robert? No, not taxable under Code 132J, Section 4. Okay, Code Section 132J4, not taxable. Okay? All right. So let me just give you a little bit of foreshadowing. First of all, again, let me emphasize the more work you do, Prepare for class, guys. You will be the benefactor. I will, too, because I'll have a better Thanksgiving. You, okay. too, will have a better Thanksgiving. So it can be a win-win. Um, again, if you're not prepared, that's life. Just my, my opinion is come to class anyway uh, because you'll do better. And it's just one person's opinion. Um, next class, guys, here, let me just give you a quick overview. We're going to finish this chapter. And... We're going to look at another exclusion, this time for meals and lodging, that if your employer provides you with meals and lodging in certain instances, not taxable, right? Now, there's a different code section here, code section 119. Now, so that's going to finish this chapter. We are going to skip chapter 5. Chapter 5, in a nutshell, not surprising, people are going to... Awards. If you get an award of some sort, it's taxable. So section 74 just emphasizes taxability of awards. We knew that. So section 61. We're then going to jump into, okay, going to jump into um, gains from dealings and property. This begins chapter 6. Very important chapter, and they all are. But this chapter is going to emphasize a code section that you're going to really have to get a good handle on. This code section, you're going to answer your repertoire of important code sections, code section 1001. Code section 1001 is a biggie in the code, like code section 10, like code section 61. Code section 1001. And I'll repeat this class on Monday, but there is going to be a simple formula that the amount realized less the adjusted basis of property equals gain or loss. Okay? The amount realized less the adjusted basis equals gain or loss. So what this means 
is, and it very, let me simplify this, is that if you buy Google stock, say, for $100 a share, that's your adjusted basis. That represents your investment in the property. And if you sell the Google stock for $120, that's your amount realized. So the amount realized, less adjusted basis, in this case, would be your gain. But let me tell you that do you think Congress makes it easier or hard to recognize gain? Easier or hard? Easy. They will make it you must realize the gain and then recognize. Okay, two fingers. Realize and recognize. In Congress, because to the extent you have gain, it represents taxable income. Agreed? By way of contrast, when it comes to losses, Congress is going to make it easier or hard, guys? Hard. hard. So, when it comes to losses, let's be realized, recognized, and what's the third finger? Allowed. Okay? And what we will learn is that the code has many disallowance provisions, okay? So that whereas the code makes it very easy to recognize gain, by way of contrast, there's many loss disallowance provisions. So we will see. Let me just give you two more code sections to ponder. Code section 165 permits losses or allows losses, code section 165. But, for example, if you sell stock to a child, a related party, you bought Google stock for 100 and now it goes down to 80. You like Google stock, you want to keep it, but you want to recognize the loss at the end of the year, you might decide to sell it to your child and recognize the loss and see, your child's going to maybe gift it back to you a week or a month or a year later. But Code Section 267 disallows the law. Okay? That's just one of many examples. 167 or 267? 267, I apologize. So, could you, in addition to finishing up Chapter 4, um, and it can't hurt, I don't know, I doubt if we finish the entirety, but try to read the entirety of Chapter 6. It will be good weekend reading. All right? So um, I will see everyone on uh, Monday, right? So we're good on five, not five. Go five. All right? Any questions, keep me posted. Otherwise, guys, have a great day. I will see you on Monday.